Hey guys, it's Move Michael with Movement Mastering, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Audio Math Survival Spreadsheet. So this is something that I made uh, over the course of reading this Mamma Jamma. It is Bob McCarthy's Sound System Design and Optimization. Uh, so Nathan Lively, another great audio tech, has a great podcast that has him talk about it. But anyway, Bob McCarthy is the grandfather of audio system design. And so he basically invented the dual channel FFT uh, for use in live sound. So brilliant dude. I think this is like a 500 page mamma jamma. So I system tech uh, in my neck of the woods on live stuff. And it's it just it was really huge to work through all this. And again, I feel like this spreadsheet only scratches the surface, but it was a helpful thing for me to put together. Uh, so I uh, could put in numbers and see things spit out and do calculations and really understand at a deeper level what's going on. So you may be asking, Michael, you're a master engineer, what are you doing in live sound? Well, uh, I firmly believe in the idea articulated in David Epstein's book called Range in that staying in a narrow niche for too long can actually hinder your career, uh, not make it deeper. Uh, because if you're able to see all of these parallel trenches around you in audio world, uh, I think you can glean all there is from what it means to be good at live sound versus studio versus composing or whatever these worlds are and fold them back into your main practice. So I have learned so much from this book that I've been able to bring back into my music production world. It has been a ton of fun. So uh, again, yeah, go check out Nathan Lively's page. Again, he has a ton of articles at sounddesignlive.com that have been really helpful to me. We've had several email exchanges. Uh, he's torn apart a few of my system designs, so it's great. So um, there's that. I'll be stopping periodically for questions. And so feel free... Uh, to say hey in the chat, but uh, what this is going to be uh, is me going through uh, the spreadsheet that you see here. Um, it's available at movementmastering.com slash audio math, and you can get the drive link for it. You just make a copy and you're free to edit it. So uh, please go snag that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to set a little timer here so I can make sure and stop for questions. And uh, if there's not, then that's great. So without further ado, we're going to just start stepping through this thing. So I'm going to give you some use cases for each of the calculators. Um, and so a lot of this is going to be geared towards live sound and system design, but a ton of these principles are applicable in music production as well. So first we have, uh, so a little bit about the spreadsheet as a whole. So again, just make a copy of it and then edit it once you have access. And any questions or fact checks to me, I'd be happy to correct anything if it's wrong or unclear. Um, all of the orange cells are inputs, the blue cells are outputs. Um, and so here are a few of the constants that I'll be using. Um, so sound is, you know, temperature affects it. So I have it at 70.91 degrees, a really pretentious temperature, so that the speed of sound for the excuse me, calculations is at 1130 feet per second, which is a nice easy number to remember. So I keep it there. So it's also available in Celsius. It gives you the speed of sound at feet per second and meters per second, feet for meters, millisecond for feet. Again, all those that you, sorry, all use that you see there. Uh, and then also you'll want to set the sampling rate because some of the free, um, calculations determine samples needed. So I know a lot of live consoles uh, work at 96, not only for fidelity, for, but for speed to get lower round trip latency at higher sample rates. But if you're on, you know, an X32, you can work at 44.1 or 48. So you could change that uh, to 48. But I'm gonna keep it at 96. So there's that. Okay, so I'm just gonna go uh, down these columns. So I've got, uh, Let's see, 153 lines. <laughs> so, and again, this was just me working through the the sound and systems, the design optimization optimization book, and putting some of the really helpful formulas into there. So, this first section is frequency. So, I'm able to put in a frequency like 100 hertz, and it gives me the cycle time. So, how long does it take for it to go up and down one time through a cycle? Uh, the wavelength for that frequency, uh, and then also two thirds wavelength. So, uh, why is two thirds wavelength helpful? Because um, if you're looking at phase, you have 360 degrees to go around the phase wheel. 
And uh, if you go 180 degrees out of phase, you get cancellation. But I can go up to 120 degrees, either forward in time or backward in time, and still get summation where the frequencies add up. And so this is different for every frequency. But if I go 120 degrees, that's the same thing as two thirds away around, aka two thirds of a wavelength. So this is helpful for when placing subs. So if I have my crossover 100 hertz or frequency divider at 100 hertz, that means the subs are handling mainly 100 hertz and below. Uh, that means I can place them up to 7.53 feet apart and still get summation. Granted, that's going to change the coverage pattern and narrow stuff, but I know that the, at that far apart is where I can get uh, summation. <clears throat> so it's also helpful for room modes. So here at a quarter wavelength, that's 2.83 feet uh, for 100 hertz. So you can see here I got a bunch of sound damping, but in velocity or absorption based um, absorbers, um, what they're doing is converting the motion of the sound wave into heat. Uh, and, it can, it, and so it's most efficient to do that when the wave is at its quarter wavelength. Basically, if it's going up and down at the quarter wavelength part, it's at its highest speed. So just like a car going 100 miles an hour versus 10 miles an hour, it's going to, you're going to do more, you need more to stop it. Um, and so it's, you know, if it's moving quickly and they're hitting a brick wall, a lot more force is lost than 10 miles an hour in it hitting a brick wall, right? Again, no one wants a car hitting a brick wall, but all I have to say, you're most effective when your absorption is at that point in the wave. So that's why, even though the panels you see behind me look like they're on the wall, there's actually an air gap behind them. So it's to get the absorption material off the wall, because if a wave is hitting the wall, that is zero, uh, I mean, velocity zero. So, <laughs> which, so it's not doing anything at the wall. So you want to get your stuff out from the wall. So anyway, uh, there's that. And then the next case, I want to see attack time for compression. So if we're looking at 100 hertz, uh, that's telling me the cycle time is 10 milliseconds. So for it to complete a full cycle. So I'm going to pull up a project here. Um, so I've got a compressor, one of my favorites, the Vertigo VSC2. Um, and so if I know that 100 hertz is where the punch is on a lot of kick drums or you know snares or just in general on a full track, I can say like, well, if I want to emphasize that with compression, I can maybe start by setting an attack time of 10 milliseconds. So what I'm going to do is alternate on this track a pretty heavy compression setting so we can hear it of one millisecond uh, versus 10 milliseconds. So, and then in that way we can hear uh, the difference between the, the transients, how they're like, you know, getting to poke through at 10 milliseconds versus getting squash at point 0.1. So here's point 0.1, they'll flip back and forth. So yeah, I hope you heard that at the 0.1 millisecond attack time, there's it felt like just like the song, a lot of pressure, like it was being forced back a lot. But when I slowed it down to 10 milliseconds, especially the snare and the hi-hat was able to kind of skip through, but then the kick got punchier. Again, this is a way more aggressive compression setting that I'd use in mastering, but illustrates the point that you can use compressors to shape transients. Uh, so it's a really, really handy tool. And just by going to the spreadsheet, and putting in like, hey, what I want, what do I want to emphasize? Well, the fundamental of the snare is at 150. I put in 150. Let me try uh, attack time of 6.67 milliseconds and see if the compressor is able to bring that out. So this is why limiters have insanely fast attack times because let's say we're sampling a 441. That means Nyquist or the highest frequencies in the spectrum is about 22k, and 22k. Um, has a cycle time of 0 0.05 milliseconds. And so that means the compressor has to react fast enough so that part of the waveform doesn't sneak through. Um, so all I have to say, uh, you can use this to help find your attack times. Okay, and then it tells you the amount of samples, so just as a, that might be quarter, uh, handy to have. Uh, also, a quarter wavelength cycle time uh, can be used in tandem with um, the room absorption calculations, which you can see here. This is a really 
handy tool, the AMROC room mode calculator. So you can put in your room dimensions. This is roughly mine. Uh, and you can see where the room modes are. It'll even play, even play a little sound for you. But all of this lines up with, and it gets, spits out all the for, uh, dimensions for you. But all of this lines up with basically all frequencies have a fixed wavelength at a given temperature. And you can use those uh, to determine your room modes. Okay, so that's frequency. Okay, I will promise we'll pick up the pace here. I'm gonna check for questions. Nothing yet, great. Okay, so cycle time. So cycle time, again, related to frequency. So if I have a 10 millisecond uh, cycle time, again, we get 100 hertz, just like we saw earlier. Um, and it tells me a wavelength of 11.3 feet. So again, very similar calculations. But cycle time, I can uh, determine that is the first peak of a comb filter. And so if I have a, two of the same waves, 10 milliseconds off, uh, two of the same thing, 10 milliseconds offset from each other, I know that the first combination when the wave, uh, the two waves combined is going to be at 100 hertz. I can also use it as the inverse uh, for determining attack time. So if I know that, hey, I have these attack times on my compressor, either it's 1, 3, 10 milliseconds, 30, whatever, I say, okay, what about if I use my 30 millisecond attack time, that's going to emphasize uh, and start to clamp down at 33.3 .3 hertz. Uh, granted, not a lot of music has stuff way down there, but it, it says, okay, this is a very slow attack time, rel relatively speaking, because a lot of other uh, ways are going to be able to do several cycles before the compressor is even thinking about clamping down. And to be clear, a compressor is not uh, clamping. <clears throat> it's not waiting a fixed amount of time before it starts compressing. It's just the attack time determines how quickly it's pressing down. Just want to make that clarification. So next is wavelength. So if I have a wavelength of 10 feet, that tells me, okay, uh, a a frequency of 113 hertz to take uh, it fits in that space, uh, and it takes 8.85 milliseconds for it to complete that time. So there's other handy stuff to have for uh, room modes, and I found it also healthy, uh, helpful for you know if I have subs in a live situation and I'm only to able to put them at a certain spot for coverage, but let's say they're five feet off a wall, I can say okay, five feet means that. Uh, I mean, if they're five feet off the wall, it means it's going to take double that time for it to bounce off the wall. They'll come back and combine with the sub. So let's make that 10 feet. So that means I'm going to get a combination or my comb filter is going to have a peak at 113. And so I can look for that um, if I'm not able to move my subs to a different spot. Uh, right there. I'll reset that. So anyway, so all these tie together, frequency, cycle time, and wavelength, and then samples. Uh, so this is if you're having to do um, uh, within a console, if something's not with your delay compensation working right, or even within a DAW, you can play with that at your sample rate um, and, and get that to happen. Uh, so 10 samples at 96 is a frequency of 9600 hertz. Um, anyway, so just healthy, helpful for those kinds of calculations. So next is phase delay. So Merlin Van Veen has a wonderful article uh, called The Subwoofer Alignment, The Foolproof Relative Absolute Method. So this is the method that I use for aligning subs. And it's really helpful. He does goes into great detail, uh, but you need to be able to calculate phase delay between your mains and sub to be able to align them. And so this is the formula that you use. And so I very much recommend you watch his full video, him explaining the process, but you can then take the data you get in the field, put it in here if you know how to do the method and figure it out. So if I got 50 hertz and 250 hertz, or even just uh, like he has in the video, just 100 hertz as a frequency, uh, you can just pick two numbers that give you that delta frequency, determine the phase offset, and then you can get the phase delay, which is super neat. So I dig that. So voltage change to dB change. So this is for... Uh, this has just really helped me understand decibels better. Uh, so I feel like before this book, yeah, I got, you know, increase something 3 dB, 5 dB, whatever, but actually knowing to a full degree what that type of increase meant uh, is, is really cool. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for a typical mic level source to be at, you know, 
0.01 volts. It's really low, but like a SM7B has like a sensitivity of nothing. And so, uh, but I need to get up to around a volt to get it to line level. And so that's a 40 dB increase, which we, we've all used about 40 dB of gain on like a 58 or something if it's a quiet talker. But that is a 10,000% change <laughs> or a hundred times bigger, which is crazy to me. So that means any noise apparent in the signal is now a hundred times louder from an amplitude perspective. Uh, and then I also added this in, in cell B, B40. This is, I, I took the curve for the Fletcher Munson. Basically, we, if a doubling in amplitude is 6 dB in, uh, in amplitude is 6 dB, we hear a doubling every 10 dB. And so if I increase something by 6 dB, it's not going to quite sound twice as loud. I'll have to make something 10 dB louder for us to perceive it as a doubling. So I took that calculation. Um, and so let's say if we went from half a volt that's a 6 dB change, so that's a 200% change, but it's only 100, you know, 52% louder perceivably. Again, that's different depending on, you know, the total amount of loudness and the and the Fletcher Munson curve is not uh, linear, but it gives us a general idea of the 10 dB doubling versus 6 dB. So that's what's going on there. So this was helpful again, just to quickly say like, okay, 6 dB doubling. 200% it's a factor of 2 or 1.52 for Fletcher Munson or how we hear. But if I gave a 20 dB increase, that's still, you don't think like 20 dB is the hugest thing in the world. I mean, I guess it's it's pretty big, but it's, you know, I think it's it's 10 times bigger from an amplitude standpoint. It's just, so it just helped that sit better for me. Uh, I'm going to check questions real quick. All right. So here we are. We got the... Yeah, so summation, synchronized and correlated. So if I got two of the exact same sources coming at me, and then one's at 100 dB SPL uh, A-weighted and one's at 96, uh, these aren't quite the same things, but it tells me like, okay, how much more uh, of a signal am I getting? So if this was only a 50 dB signal, I'm only getting a 3 dB increase or 150% versus if this was 99 dB, I'm getting my almost my doubling or it's at 199%. So, uh, so if you have just two sources that are synchronized and correlated and if they're different in volume, what is my total output because of that? So again, we were talking about a comb filter earlier. So if I got something offset by 10 milliseconds, my first peak, like I said, is at 100, but also tells me my dips. So the, again, this is helpful if I have subs against the wall and I know the distance, I can kind of guesstimate where my dips are going to be if I don't have time to get out the smart rig. So even with the five millisecond offset, so if they're two and a half feet off the wall, I'm still gonna get a dip right at 100. So that's not helpful because that's right at my crossover. Um, so I can either flip my subs around or just try and change placement to mitigate some of that if it becomes a problem. So front to back distant ratio. So this helps determine, do I need a delay system or will a single spe speaker system cover it? And so if I can just measure in a theoretical situation, either a map XT or just with a disto on site. So like, okay, it's 10 feet from my speaker. Uh, so yeah, 10 feet from my speaker to the front row, 30 feet to the back. Um, and that gives me a distance ratio of three to one. And that also tells me that it's going to be about 10 dB quieter in the back than it is in the front. Um, and so I can mitigate some of that depending where I aim my speaker or height or, you know, whatever. But it just can give me a quick um, number for determining do I need delays or not. So a good rule of thumb is if it's greater than 4 to 1, you definitely need it because you're going to get some help from room gain, a.k.a. sound bouncing around in the room and getting to the back. So uh, that's when you really know. So... If it's, you know, a distance ratio 4 to 1, that means 12 dB down the back, which is a, a significant difference. As we talked about earlier, 10 dB is half as loud from a psychoacoustic perspective, so it's less than half as loud in the back. So that gives you that there. So acoustic transmission path. So if I from source A to point C, it takes 5 milliseconds to travel. And source from B to C, 10 milliseconds, uh, it says that it's about half as loud because that's half the distance, right? So if I one millisecond to 10, that's a 20 dB difference. Um, 
and it's that's the distance uh, in offset. So it's 10 feet if that's the timing offset. Uh, and it gives me third and quarter wavelengths for different cancellations that I can figure into the comb filter. Uh, so that tells me if something is nine milliseconds offset, I'm gonna get my first dip at 56 hertz, and it's gonna stop summing at 37 hertz. So let's do something a little bit smaller. So maybe eight, yeah, there we go. So even something that's just two milliseconds offset, um, you start to get a comb filter at 250, <laughs> which is crazy. So really, really time aligning stuff so that everything's coherent is helpful. Cause even, again, it feels so small, but two milliseconds, that's where you start to get a comb filter. So that was really revealing to me to really put that in perspective of really making sure my both, uh, you know, if I have a main and a delay or two speakers sharing custody of an area to really get them time aligned. So then next I got speaker coverage to forward aspect ratio and lateral aspect ratio. That's what FAR and LAR stand for. So if I got a speaker that's 75 degrees wide, or yeah, let's just call it um, its coverage width. Uh, it's a forward aspect ratio of 1.64 and lateral aspect ratio of 1.22. So you can dive more into that. Again, another article that Nathan Lively wrote, he wrote it for Sound Girls but you can uh, determine your forward aspect ratio by measuring the distance, your, your coverage area, the depth, and then get the width. And then, so it's length divided by width. So it's pretty easy. And then you put it into this formula, which I have in the spreadsheet, and that determines the perfect speaker for that space for its shape to fill up what's going on. So that's really, really handy. And so let's say, well, I can't do a center, center hang. I have to do two. And you just divide that in half. And so, um, you would then go down here to the section one coverage area FAR. So if I have a hundred for easy math, 100 foot deep, 50 foot wide, that means it's a FAR of two, but then, well, wait a minute. I actually want to uh, use two speakers. I can use that and I need a speaker of four, uh, FAR of four. So if I put that into here, I would need a super narrow speaker. So you can, again, that's a really deep room and, and not very wide. So let me bring up something a little bit more reasonable. So if I had a room FAR at 1.8, that means I would need a 67 degree speaker to fill that up. So it's basically just, you know, what size of rectangle do you have for your room? And the, the speaker is gonna have a certain like really narrow or really wide coverage. Um, and it determines, so having a, <clears throat> Uh, forward aspect ratio determines what speaker shape appropriately fits what's going on. So you may be asking, okay, that was forward aspect ratio was LAR, a lateral aspect ratio. So a speaker, uh, so as you saw here, it has, uh, this is a 106 degree speaker, I think in his example. Um, so it, you see how, how it kind of rounds out right here, but let's say you are shooting at a flat target. So let's pretend this this line right here is that. So it'd be more of a triangle. Uh, and so lateral aspect ratio says like, okay, for a given speaker, let's say if I'm throwing it uh, sound 10 feet, I multiply it by the lateral aspect ratio and say like, okay, it's gonna be, it's multiplier 1.22 wide is how wide it's going to be. So if I just take a 90 degree speaker, it's FAR and LAR are actually the same. And so if I went here, so throwing it 10 feet and then multiply it by its 1.14, 1.41, 1 sorry. That means um, it's throwing 10 feet, but the actual line how wide or li that line, the length of that line that's covering is going to be 14 feet, which is cool. And so if I have a narrow speaker, that means it's gonna to have to throw farther, but I won't cover as wide. So that's what's going on there. Okay, great. So front fill and uncoupled array spacing. This is me, again, this is all out of Bob's book, but I know Daniel Lundberg made this app. So this is the fancier visual version of the app uh, where you can put in your speaker spacing, its coverage angle, if you're splaying it out, uh, and it'll tell you the unity distance, which is basically at what point am I gonna be able to walk a straight line across my audience It's gonna feel the same across all the speakers. And then the maximum distance is basically how, how uh, it's, 
how, you basically double your unity distance and then how long is that going to hold up before three sources start to combine. Um, and so it's a simplified version uh, right here. Uh, and so you can go right here, put in a custom angle, which is cool. So like, oh, I got a hundred degree box. All right, I got a few examples here, like, okay, CPA is a 90 degree box, uh, a K12. I just use these speakers a lot, so I put them in here. So this is a 75 degree box. It is 10 feet to the first row, I got four of them. So that means I can put them 12 feet apart, uh, and then that will get me 20 feet into the audience, and, and it covers 48 feet wide, which is super cool. So that's helpful if like, I know my main array has to go in a certain spot in the room and it can cover this much. I was like, oh, I think need some support down front. How many speakers at a given coverage angle do I need and how far do I need to place them to cover this area? So that's what it helps me do. So I'm gonna check for questions. All right, so asymmetric couple point source design. Yeah, it's a mouthful. So this says uh, for two speakers, um, if I, let's say if I got two in the air, so one's pointed at the back row here, and then I have just another pointed down to cover this, uh, given you know their coverage angles, uh, and based off this one, speaker A is shooting farther than speaker B, at what angle do I need to tilt down speaker B, and how much do I need to turn it down to get the most even coverage across the plane? So if I got a 90 degree speaker and a 75 degree speaker, this one's throwing 50 feet, B is throwing 25 feet. Uh, it's a two to one range ratio. I got to turn speaker B down 60 B and then I need a 20 degree angle splay between the two to get the most even coverage. Sorry, I just did that without you seeing it. So, uh, so that's 90 degree speaker, 75 degree, it's throwing 50 feet and 25 feet, speaker A and speaker B. The range ratio is two to one so that uh, between the, the distance that those speakers are throwing, and I need to turn speaker B down 60 B as a 20 degree splay angle I need to have between those two speakers. So I'm gonna get some overlap because they are a 90 and 75 degree box. All right. So next is line length LF cutoff. So basically I can look at a line array like I have here, and this is about an eight foot line array in this example, we'll come back to it. Um, it says that at 72 degrees, uh, 142 hertz is that cutoff. And then beyond that, it starts kind of spreading and getting wider than what's going on. Um, so granted, this array is covering 50 degrees, and so the 142 is still already wider than the array. But let's demonstrate that here. Right now, I got 140 selected, and I can see here that you know, it's shooting, I have, there's some level tapering, or not level tapering, but just kind of uh, box angles are affecting some of this. But all that to say, the 140 is being shaped this way. So let me go down, way down in frequency, and you can just see how it's going to be much more omnidirectional now. And so, again, just putting it in, uh, how how big is my speaker array, and when and am I going to start to get some type of steering uh, and this is all assuming to having put any all pass filters in to do any beam steering. So that's just helpful to know that like, okay, do I really have to worry about the side lobes off a rig in this particular situation or like directly off the bottom of it bouncing off the stage um, at a given frequency uh, at this certain spot? And so this will tell me at what point am I kind of clear from stuff bouncing off those north and south poles of the rig versus east and west. All right, and then, okay, next one, constant curvature array taper. So this is neat if you're using a VRX uh, type situation, which I end up in a lot. Uh, so you can have up to six boxes. So there are six points here. Uh, so you could pull up VRX LAC, uh, and this qu isn't quite the numbers I have plugged in here, but if I had a four box array and this was my listening plane, all I did was get out pixel stick and actually measure the amount of pixels from the top box to the back, middle box to here, and just trace these lines. And then you can put those numbers in here and they'll tell you how much you need to taper those boxes to get the even coverage across those, um, 
those instances. Again, VRX just has a knob on the back and who knows how tightly calibrated or the tolerances between those boxes are. But if you've got enough matrices or outputs or a DSP, go crazy. But this says like, okay, this is a pretty big gap between a 60 foot throw versus a 12 foot throw. And I just put, threw those numbers in there. It's a five to one range ratio. So that's pretty aggressive. Um, so that means top box at full gas and then taper the bottom one 14 dB to get the most even HF coverage. Um, so LF is going to be a battle no matter what, just because the way the array works. I'm not going to jump into that here, but um, at lower range ratios, uh, this is much more effective. You're not going to get as much pink shift or kind of low mid beaming and weird stuff. So all I have to say, you can use it uh, in a pinch to determine how much you need to shade boxes on your VRX. So single loudspeaker aiming, I got this from Daniel Lundberg as well, who made the uncoupled array calculator. This is his blog article that I just ripped off <laughs> these from here. Uh, but anyway, I plugged in uh, distance to front, distance to back, and then the angle. So basically, if I were to have a piece of pie, you know, this is shooting to the back, shooting to the front. What is that angle? And then it would say, like, where to point that speaker uh, and then what, uh, co nominal coverage ang angle of the vertical nominal coverage angle of that speaker uh, so that it would cover the sp space the most. Again, this is out of Bob's book as well. Uh, and so it is going to not work if you have a distance more than, uh, or I guess a front to back ratio more than two to one. So 15, the max I could go is 30. So if I put in, you know, 100 or something, it's not going to work. So just know that. I need to figure out a way to make an if error and solve that. I will update that later. So next is asymmetric composite couple point source design. All right. So this, uh, I've plugged in these numbers from the array I've designed here in MapXT. So the very top angle is basically the very top box of what, you know, if our... Uh, lateral line here is zero at what point is it tilted down the very bottom angle is the bottom box its angle and that tells me the delta between the two and that is going off here in this array let me put this back to 4k and so if i just measured from here see i got this orange line going from the middle to the back and then the bottom to here that's basically my coverage angle of this array um, that's what I've plugged in here. Uh, and I've also put in the throw distance, 102 feet and 32 feet, which gives me my range ratio. So that de helps me determine uh, for my range ratio, if, if I have a three to one, that means I probably need to break up my rig into an A, B, and C segments to accomplish that. So I have a range ratio of four to one, I probably need to A, B, C, D, and then so on and so forth. Um, so the calculations also tell me if you put in the max splay of the boxes and the minimum splay, I tell you the average and says, hey, I, you need at least 8.7 or basically nine boxes of this uh, of this spec to pull off what you're asking this rig to do, which is pretty cool. So let's say you uh, I, there's one particular calculation, this next one that I'm really excited about, but if you know the top box to the back row, the bottom box to the front row, which is from this MapXT example, uh, and the front row to back row, so basically measuring this bottom line of like here at 48 feet on back to 135, and this is a rig from a real world example, uh, it says, hey, I need 50 degrees to get there, which lines up with uh, what I designed earlier here. And the median throw distance, that basically means what does the middle of the ray to the middle of the audience, how long is that? Um, which is used in the formula, if you give it the audience width, that means I need at least an 80 degree box to cover um, an audience that is 80 feet wide if it's throwing 63 feet. And that's using our same calculation from earlier to, for our lateral aspect ratio to give us that. So if my audience was 40 feet wide, that means I only need a 37 degree box to pull that off. But if it's 100 feet wide, it says I need a 106 degree box um, to do that. And so I need a rig from a vertical standpoint that can cover 50 degrees. And then I need a 106 
uh, degree wide box if I'm aiming at the middle of the middle of the audience to cover that well. Granted, if uh, there's a bigger disp a bigger range ratio, that means I'm probably going to need some front fills or side fills to fill in. Uh, but this gives me a good ballpark number like, okay, I need at least a 106 degree box to pull this show off. Okay, home stretch here, folks. Uh, the, so the flown array horizontal coverage estimator. So disregard B123, I'm still working on that. But uh, we got the box coverage angle. So I got a 100 degree box. I have 60 uh, audience depth, audience width, and mid array height. So I basically, at what point in the array is the middle middle of the array throwing to the middle of the room? Um, and again, I'm going to tweak this a little bit. But that says middle of the array is throwing 35 feet. Uh, a 100 degree box is then able to cover 54 uh, feet wide. And if my audience width is 39 feet, that means it's covering, over covering 139% of that. So let's say I had a really wide audience, like 100 feet, uh, and I'm only getting 54 feet wide of coverage because I don't have a high trim height. That means it's only covering half the audience at that point. And so if I can give myself some ballpark numbers of like, okay, my audience, you know, 80 feet deep, 60 feet wide, I can get the middle of the ray 20 feet in the air, uh, and I got 100 degree box. That means, okay, I'm able to cover most of the middle of the audience there. It also gives my, my speaker FAR and LAR to put in other calculations if you need it. Okay, so two more, and then a couple charts. So we're on, I'm gonna check for questions, all right. So array planner. So this doesn't really do a whole lot of calculations for you except here at the end. But um, I can, from our example earlier, if I knew I had a 3.2 to one range ratio, that means I needed an A, B, C array. Um, and so I can put in here some tentative splay angles that add up to like, okay, my total splay was negative 50, just like this one said, I need a 50 degree angle here. And then my average spray is negative 4.2. But if you change the colors here, it can it just help as a visual say like, okay, all these belong together, all those belong together. Um, I can turn some off if I need it. Uh, so just kind of helpful, like in the field, if you're seeing to plan, but you don't want to open up map XT or a calc or whatever, uh, it can help you on the fly determine with a certain amount of boxes, how I need to ballpark an array. Uh, and lastly, probably the nerdiest of them all, <laughs> the beaming frequency. So in constant curvature arrays, uh, let's say if I got four boxes at 15 degrees, so we all know that VRX, 15 degree vertical coverage, right? So if I got four of them here and they're pointed, um, the total amount of coverage is 60 degrees of my pizza pie, but uh, it has this phenomenon called the beaming frequency, L Acoustics coined it, that um, you basically at a certain point will have a dip in the amount of vertical coverage in the frequency response, and it'll gradually come back up. And it's usually in the mid-range, around 500 hertz, most of the time is the worst offender. So if you put in your number of boxes um, and total coverage, you can determine your low frequency vertical coverage nominal. So it's good, the low frequencies are gonna be at the nominal coverage angle up to 222 hertz, and then they're gonna start narrowing to 40 degrees. Uh, instead of your full 60, and then resume normal back at 738. So again, super nerdy, but just something I could put in there. And here we go, home stretch is these charts. Uh, so if you, these are all about Bob's books. And so this is linear to dB. So a 1.5, 1 1.1 multiplier difference expressed in dB is 0.83 and so on and so forth. Again, we saw a 10x increase in amplitude is the same thing as 20 dB louder. Uh, this is sound propagation loss, basically the inverse square lot work. This is bandwidth versus Q because, you know, some, you know, Midas, at least on the Pro 2C that I work on, uh, talks in bandwidth, but, you know, the X32 or the or Yamaha CL5 talks in Q. Uh, this is coverage angle to forward aspect ratio. So this is in the calculator, but if you just need a reference chart, you can determine that. Lateral aspect ratio, again, uh, speaker coverage. Um, and it also tells you the effectiveness. So, if, you know, are we getting, if we got a 90 degree box, what percentage of that is really covering, sorry, in the lateral aspect ratio of what's going on? Speaker order classification. Uh, this is just a Bob McCarthyism that you'll see in his book, but it's just uh, fun to have handy. Then asymmetric couple point source design reference. So this is the 
using asymmetric couple point sources, if I were to uh, have them together and then have a unity splay, if I had different range ratios, how much do I need to turn one box down to get um, them to play nice with them shooting at different distances? Great. Okay, that was a whole lot, but if you made it to the end of this, congratulations. So uh, anyway, you can get the spreadsheet at movementmastering.com slash audio math. Again, useful for studio stuff, a lot of live sound. I think it'll help make some sense for you if you're having to, you know, uh, check through this book as well. So I'm Michael with Movement Mastering, and I appreciate you hanging out. See ya.